Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining. Happy Pride. Um, I'm so excited to be able to host this event and um, wrap up Pride Month. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining the Launching Your Career as an LGBTQ IA plus professional Plen Talk event. Um, I'm excited to introduce the moderator of our panel, Raquel Gonzalez. Um, Raquel is the political partner at the Truman National Security Project and a longtime supporter of Plen. I will now hand it over to Raquel to introduce herself and fellow panelists. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Happy uh, end, of, end of Pride Month here. Glad to be wrapping it up with this really great panel here. Um, so yeah, I'm actually working as a visiting DEIJ senior fellow at the Truman Center for National Policy and helping them with their policies, um, poss uh, culture and processes around um, equitable and inclusive cultures, which includes the LGBTQ plus community. So excited to be here with you all today. We've got some really great panelists. Um, so we are joined here today by Taylor Westfall, Foreign Affairs Officer at the US Department of State, Matthew Rose, Director at the Global Health Strategies, and Steph Neopai at Equity uh, at Grinder, Equity Outreach Manager. And so I'll just kick it off to each one of you. Let's go in the order that I just said um, to give a quick little intro of yourself um, and the role that, that you play. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, good. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you're doing well. Happy Pride. Quite a uh, quite a month. Uh, the, I work at U.S. Department of State, uh, so a federal employee here. Um, I work in the Office of Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, one of my portfolios is covering LGBT rights globally, um, so working to advocate for stronger policies in the United Nations context. So currently negotiating resolutions at the UN um, to provide stronger protections uh, and discrimination against LGBTQIA plus persons. Um, I work closely to support the special envoy here at Department of State. Um, we do for the first time in several years have a special envoy again, Jessica Stern. Uh, so working to bring together civil society and governments um, to advocate for policy. Um, so excited to be here, pronouns are she, her, and back to you, Raquel, thanks. Great, Matthew, would you please? Yeah, my name is Matthew Rose. Uh, I am a Washington creature in some ways. I have been an advocate in the city for about 12 years. I currently work for a global health uh, communications and advocacy firm. Uh, I've worked on most big health policy things and from the HIV perspective for my entire career in Washington. I worked on the ACA, I've worked on Medicaid reform, I've worked on ACA rule implementation that seems to never die, uh, worked on the national, multiple national HIV national strategies. Um, I'm currently consulting for the CDC on monkeypox. Um, I've done work on COVID, uh, but I've done the creature, the work uh, of being in Washington working on both the Hill and with the administrative agencies. And so happy to be on a call with Taylor. I love your boss. Jessica's a good friend. Taylor Matt says hi. I use he, him pronouns. Thanks, I forgot to say, but you can see in my um, title that I use she or they pronouns. Um, Steph, over to you. Hey everyone, thank you for having me. Stephanie Pari, they, them pronouns. And as you can see, I work for Grindr, wrapping my, my uh, company today. Uh, really excited to, to talk to you a little bit more. I'm the Equality Outreach Manager, and I started about, uh, I would say, a, a little less than two months ago. Um, you know, getting to, to this space has also involved me being in different nonprofits, being on the Hill, being at firms. It's kind of moved on from different spaces, and happy to share more about that. I'm also the founder for Plantita Power, which is um, a national food and body liberation um, group that distributes food and seedlings to the cutie bite pop community also throughout the United States. And yeah, just getting to do a little bit of everything, as, as Matthew said. Great, thank you all. And I love seeing DC small world that people already know each other, know their, their workspaces and everything. This is like so DC for people who are not actually used to the culture around here. Um, okay, so in my own job search, right? I'm, I'm always looking for how you find a place that's gonna be inclusive and where I'm gonna feel safe and welcome. And I'm sure that the people who are um, joining us today are also looking for some help with that. So could you share a little bit about how you assess the culture of a new uh, as a job seeker when you're looking for inclusiveness as a as a queer person 
what kind of metrics are you looking for? What kind of questions are you asking in your job interview process to determine sort of where they are and whether that's a good fit for you? Um, let's go in the opposite order this time. Stuff first, please. Sure. I think for me, um, I was starting out, I was, you know, I didn't know these questions, right? I didn't even know what to ask or if it was okay for me to wear like um, my binder to work or what was, what were people going to say if like I cut my hair? Um, I remember that being a big thing when I was at uh, the Organization of American States. I had my hair was pretty long and everything. And I'm like, I'm going to get an undercut and I don't know how people are going to feel about it. And I'm going to wear my septum. And when walking in the door, uh, during uh, my interview process with that same cut. And I was like, if this is gonna be how, how they see me then, and they're okay with it, and they hire me, then I'm gonna be okay staying there, right? So for me, it's very much about not having to perform all the time, not having to wear clothes that I don't want to, um, and making sure that, you know, at least there's some kind of trainings going on. Um, that's of course evolved <laughs> uh, as uh, going into different jobs and especially walking into Grindr. Uh, one of my biggest things was uh, as I go through the process of changing my name, um, looking for other things that I might need that are gender affirming, what kind of support is the company going to give me? And luckily I've been able to find everything I need here. So I think when you're looking for that, it's also assessing what you need yourself, right? And that's gonna be a big thing because as you know, every queer person is different. Um, and making sure that you know what those needs are when you're approaching a job is important. Because I, I've had the distinct advantage uh, by shortcutting some things. I have never not had a boss that wasn't queer. Um, so every head of every organization I've ever worked for has been either queer, gay, bisexual, um, and that, that's helped. Um, I also tell people like, as you get later in the interview process, like when you're, when you're that second round and like they're about to like push you that third round, ask to see the employee handbook. Um, and what you're looking for there is like inclusive policies. So you're looking for what they say around if there's a dress code, like what does the dress code say? Also dress codes are kind of stupid, but like, what does it say? Like, what does it say what it are on like family and medical leave? How is it defining and thinking about family? Uh, in terms of healthcare that you're providing, are they providing options that are affirming of all bodies, all types of people and all kinds of conditions? And that's that goes for just beyond being queer. Like you just feel like, I always make sure I have good mental health coverage because I'm like, listen, I worked at nonprofits for a long time. I'm not corporate now, but I, I am a workaholic. And so I'm gonna need to make sure that my mental health can be taken care of. And then if you can, you know, the beauty of the HIV community is that we're not that big. I mean, we're big, but we're not that big. So you always know someone who works somewhere and you can ask some people, but definitely like peep the policies. Cause if, at least if it's written down on paper, you have something to complain to. And you should all, also look for what their enforcement act, mechanism of action is if there's a complaint around something. So like, who am I, who do I get redressed to? And what do they do about that? Um, if they're not forthcoming with that, then you're like, do you really care about equity? I also sleep in an interview. I always tell people, remember when you're interviewing for a job, as much as they're interviewing you, you're interviewing them. So you can ask like, what is your commitment to equity? Like, how do you show up for the various pieces that you say you represent? And you, what does it mean to come to the workspace? What do you do around, you know, pick X? It's like, sometimes I'm like, what do you do for LGBT history month? Because everybody tells you what they do for pride month. And they're like, yeah, oh, we got it. But they're like, history month. Uh, I'm like, mm, okay, okay, I see where you're at. Do you have an, an affinity group? How is that affinity group supported? But there are, there are some early tells that you can like delve into during the interview process. So like ask your like, you know, what's a day like for this? But also ask like, I'd like to look at your employee handbook. I'd like to know if you have affinity groups. I'd like to know what kind of policies you do and how you define family. Um, Cause like if I, like if my chosen family is sick and injured, I'm going to them. So I'm gonna need leave and family leave and I'm gonna need you to treat it like you would any other family leave. So those are just some questions that I have and tools I've picked up over the years of like combing through and figuring some things out. And sometimes <laughs> with some organizations, you think just because they have fam at the head of them, you realize that that's not in the handbook anywhere. And you're like, huh, 
not codified. Mm, little suspect. Also look at their, if you can, for nonprofits, look at their board. Um, that tells you some things about who they think should be running them. So those are, those are all my stuff. Over. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful comments, Matthew and Steph. And I think, Steph, your point about really knowing what you need out of a workplace is so important. Um, as, a, as a white, very, you know, femme presenting woman, I don't have the same like obvious concerns about gender presentation um, in other places. State Department is also not a place that I would go if you're seeking like radical progressive employment. Um, so I think like really looking at what your goals are in, in a job and, and sort of where you want to affect change. And then if you want a job that is like clearly also aligned to being queer, looking at those different spaces. So it's neat that we have people in private companies and public and NGO, I have experienced before. I mean, State Department, their policies are going to be very clear. They're going to be very Googleable. You are going to know exactly what is happening and that transparency is there. But a thousand percent, you are spending more, I spend more time with my coworkers than I spend with my family, with my wife, with anyone else. It is absolutely your job and duty to ask those questions. And, and honestly, if you get a response that is not appropriate, if you don't feel comfortable, um, there are a lot of jobs out there. And so I think sometimes that, that when you're working from a place of, of, of fear and nervousness about finding something like that gut instinct, we have to learn to trust ourselves. Um, and, and if possible, and that's also speaking from a place of privilege to, to try not to put ourselves in situations that we that we feel unsafe. Um, I, I switched from an office that I would say was much more conservative. I felt very nervous discussing my, my relationship previously. I also think it was a learning opportunity um, for a lot of those coworkers who, who had never sort of interacted with someone uh, who identified as, as queer. Um, in my current job, I will say diversity is in a lot of different ways. And so I, I think that having, I do have queer bosses, uh, which is wonderful. And I, and I work in a space that I'm advocating for LGBT rights as part of my portfolio. So you're gonna have a lot of queer folks. I also think looking at the diversity of the panelists who are um, interviewing you for a job to look at sort of like who works in an office. I mean, it's not just, it's racial, it's ethnic, it's age, it's where they're coming from. If you're working with a group of people who are all coming from liberal bubbles of the US, that is gonna be a really different dynamic than if you know that people are coming from all over the US from different international um, places, what their experience is. Um, I think, I think finding like what matters to you in a job and then making sure that you do feel comfortable. I mean, a specific question you can just ask is describe, describe the culture of your office. Um, describe, describe sort of your philosophy on, on sharing about, about personal life. Do you hang out outside of the office? Um, and I think, I think those things are really important. So back to you, Becca, thanks. Thank you. Really, really great advice there. I love the, the comment around checking whether the organization is performative. If they're like using coded language that makes it seem like they really care about these issues, but then do they actually have it codified in their own handbook? Are they actually enforcing when people are, you know, making, uh, like, you know, intentionally misgendering someone or something like that? Um, that's something that I personally have found to be the case a number of places in my own job search. And so we'll plus one that, that advice there. So there was this other comment here that I, that I loved about, like, it depends on what sector you're working in, right? So I have a lot of experience working in the government sector where I've often been the only person who's like a lot of different things, queer, person of color, low income, first college graduate, first college, first generation college graduate, like all, all of those sort of like marginalized identities. And, um, and we know that there's like really just a fraction of public policy positions held by folks in the LGBTQI plus community. So can you, can you all talk about what kind of barriers does our community face um, when approaching high level policy positions and what sort of experiences or resources have helped you overcome a career in public policy? And I'll toss that to whoever wants to take it first. I'll hop in. Um, St. Taylor reminds me of 
one of the big fights we had with the Biden administration coming in is that until this year, so 2020, when, but actually it was 2022 when she finally got approved by the Senate, but we didn't have our first lesbian ambassador. Like, think about that. <laughs> now, great thing, she's a lesbian ambassador of color. Yes, but like, it is still a challenge in some places. Um, some of our elders are actually, who've been in some of the places are actually really helpful figuring out like, how do you na how do you navigate some of these things? How can you be helpful? And it, I found one of the things that has worked well in my career for all kinds of things, is just asking elders, like, can we grab coffee? And let me, can I just ask you about your career journey? Like, what 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 bothered you? What How did you get through this? I just want to pick your brain really quick. And when you say coffee, like, it, it's like, more casual and more laid back. It's not as formal as lunch, um, but that has been really helpful. There are moments where you're one, um, people try to put you in the box of just being one part of your identity and like, oh, we heard you're the gay one. So that's all you can talk about. And you're like, no, I have other thoughts on other things. Like I can do more than, I can talk more, Yes, I work on HIV, but I can talk actually about whole health systems here and insurance beyond just what affects for HIV. And breaking down people's kind of limited knowledge and explaining how your unique experience allows you to understand and speak to a certain level of a lot of other broader kind of truths and modalities. Um, it, it can be frustrating as you like get to be the only one in the room and when you're the only one in the room, your opinion has to be speaking for like all of your communities at once, which is exhausting. And, or they just assume that because they've talked to you, they have checked that box and don't need to do anything else with anybody else. Uh, so there, that that does happen. Uh, I always try to say, if I, if, I, if I can get in the room, that means there's at least a cracked door somewhere. And my, part of my job is to make sure that door is a little bit easier for the next person and to invite some other people to the table with me. Like roll deep with your squads. Um, what I will say about, and Taylor can probably say this more, like I know about the people who work fed life, there are queers everywhere and you can roll deep. We have in DC, if you get a job in DC, there's an organization called Q Street, which has literally all the LGBT lobbyists, uh, hill workers, um, some government employees come to it, nonprofit folks who work on the government. And we all just kind of get together and network. And there's some great networking advice you can get from them. We help each other out sometimes when we have tricky things. Um, sometimes we we kind of create the gay agenda uh, and move it secretly. But there are, there are groups and there are people who've been there before who can be really supportive. And we don't have to do this work alone. It's remembering that we aren't stuck in this alone. I love that so much, Matthew. Um, I, yeah, I, you know, I watch, um, I, I encourage you all to, to Google it. I had this beautiful reception yesterday. So Lavender Scare, which many people may or may not be familiar with, was a policy after the Red Scare when we tried to like root out the communists uh, from the government. But the Lavender Scare was a subsequent one in, it was through the 90s, but essentially like the period of time in the 50s and 60s where there was an effective policy that fired queer people or anyone suspected of same-sex conduct or behavior from the federal government, thousands. And until the 90s, you could not get a security clearance if they could prove that you had opened, because it was a liability to have classified material. So when you think about that, um, that is a really, really short time ago. That is under 30 years ago. And frankly, it's been happening, it was happening since then. It didn't just like stop in 95 with the Clinton policy. But I think you have to like remember that those like systemic barriers to inclusion on a federal level are not that far in our distance. And so when you're thinking about barriers to senior level public policy positions, you can't just, in my world, you can't just like come in at the top with like not a lot of experience back. So there are very few people that, I mean, Special Envoy Stern is, is one of them that has not worked in the government and is coming in at a senior level policy position as an appointee, right? And so typically people are moving up through that system and have that experience. And so the, the transformative nature of, of essentially being blocked out of those spaces, and it's not just the queer community. I mean, you look systemically at racial barriers we've had in, in government and state department specifically, there's plenty of information uh, on that as well. I think, again, finding your community now 
and having people that are in these positions build you up and bring you in is so, so crucial and looking for those opportunities. I mean, there's fascinating history to know and appreciate. Um, but also if you look now, I mean, diplomatic security who grants those clearances is one of the strongest allies and is the one kind of forward leaning on this, on this information. Um, I do, I do think I, I, your point, Matthew, was so important on what resources have, have helped us overcome. It's people, it's community, it's looking at those affinity groups. It's not being afraid to reach out and ask people to have those conversations. Um, there, Glyfa is the affinity group for, for federal like foreign affairs agencies, and we are 3,000 plus members strong. Um, of that, you know, it is when I joined, I was the only kind of like female board member they'd had in, in several years. It is definitely a male uh, dominated group and being and being willing to be like, you know what, I also deserve space and want to take this up. And we've had we have two trans uh, gender members on the board. Now we have additional women like getting involved. I think there's some part of this that if you aren't willing to put yourself out there, it's harder for others to know to bring you into that circle. And so sometimes that is that is scary, but if you are in a place where you feel comfortable and safe, I will say that I was not like a, wearing this identity of like being a queer person in the department was something I just like did not lean into for years. And the beauty and the joy and the respect, honestly, of colleagues who really appreciate my willingness and openness to talk to lots of different people about that has actually opened a lot of doors. And I want to underscore um, that that is also an important thing to talk about, that I think that I have made a lot of really senior level connections because I love bringing my authentic self and, and my like passion to talk about um, LGBT rights and my family and all of that to work. I, I do want to say that that can also be a beautiful thing. Um, so I think that that we need to frame too of what are the opportunities to do that instead of the fear behind it. Over. Right. And I know here, like the question we're looking at, you know, it's high level positions, but how do you even break it in? Right. Um, and for me, my jump start was the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute. I was one of their fellows and that you know, it was my 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 way into the hill, right? And as their first non-binary fellow, it just made me aware of all the things that we need to work on. And that's something that I've been really happy to coordinate with Marco Davis, the AD, to make sure that in every cohort coming forward, let's do the outreach that we need to get more queer and trans individuals as part of this that are also Latinx that wouldn't have the funding from, you know, the Midwest or any other city to come to DC and be able to afford to, to live here, you know, in a few weeks, because you know how it is sometimes you get hired and they, they want you there in, um, the next day, right? And how do you pick up and go? A lot of folks have undocumented families. They can't afford to just be able to do this move. And um, with uh, CHCI, it's been a really a great way to just when, once you get here, navigate the space, you have alumni um, all over that is able to either house you if something happens, like we're very well connected. We we just wanna make sure that you stay here and, and you do the best you can and let's get you up there, right? And we have now a few chief of staffs that are also part of the CHCI um, alumni association. And you know everyone is just making sure that we have each other's back. And that's one thing that I've really appreciated about the space overall is making sure that we know the resources are out there for us. Beautiful, thank you all. And the most recent comment stuff around um, undocumented folks brings to mind the concept of intersectionality and how you, know, you can have multiple different layers of identity, multiple sort of marginalized identities, um, that you can, you can be feeling discrimination and microaggressions from lots of different angles. So I wonder if you, you all can sort of talk a little bit about navigating the workplace um, as a queer person of color who may be more likely to experience harassment or discrimination um, than white counterparts and how white queer people and allies can address these inequities in the workplace pitch that out to whoever wants to take that first, thanks. 
Jeff, I'm looking at you. <laughs> I'm like bringing up all the, the little memories that I got. For me, if, if we're talking about specifically uh, queer white allies or however you want to call them, our, 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 our folks in the community, y'all have to say something and y'all have to say something when people are around. You can't be inboxing me, DMing me, oh, that was bad, right? Like that person shouldn't have said that, right? Then say it at the table, say it at the Zoom meeting, say it when everybody else is present. Like, I don't need to take the responsibility of now hearing how you feel bad for me. I don't need your grievances, like I need you to speak up and say something, right? Um, and as someone who is also uh, larger as well, and like, as I'm navigating just different places, and as soon as I walk in, you're going to be able to see me. I might be short, but like, I act very big. So it's like, don't, <laughs> if you're going to have my back, then have my back. If not, don't DM me about it. I don't care. Yeah, I I find that and have found, especially in the HIV side that you have, there is a, as a black gay man, well, as I like to say, for political reasons, I'm a black gay man because I got to check some boxes. In reality, I'm probably more like a queer stolen African, but that's a whole different discourse. But what happens a lot is that the way I have to advocate in those spaces can't be the same. Like I have to be very measured about how I get mad and when I get loud because I can't have you just see a loud, angry black person and then just ignore my words because, but then the white person can say the exact same thing with the exact same tone and you listen to him. I, I think Steph's right. You, you, people have to show up. And I think we all have to show up for each other. Like I, I've been in rooms where it's like, oh, there are all these ladies who said all these things. And sometimes the men are just blatantly taking credit without ever acknowledging other people or we're gonna talk like the trans folks are just a thing that happens in our community, but we're not gonna actually talk to them to figure out what we need to do. And so carving out that inclusive space, and it means, you know, sometimes I take up space and then immediately surrender that space to other voices, um, especially other voices on the particular issue. And you've gotta, you've gotta figure out kind of where you fit in and where you need help and where you not only need help, but where you can help others. And we can all then push it forward together because we're not perfect spaces. We have, especially especially in the policy scene, we are overly dominated by white gay men. Um, they have a lot of access to power. They make a lot of decisions. That's just kind of how it is. It is getting better in my 12 years of Washington. I can say I've watched it get better. I've watched white gay men learn that they have to sometimes sit down and shut up. Like sometimes their job is to fund the forum so that other people can have a discussion. Um, but we've got to acknowledge that we've got to figure out ways to lift each other up. Uh, I, I choose, sometimes I used to have the uh, women the Obama administration used to do in meetings, which is they just repeat what the other one said until someone realizes that it was said by them. Um, and sometimes we just have to echo and help and support that way. But it is, it really is like, my multiple identities make me realize the importance of so many other peoples and the space that I take up and the space that I can help others take up with me and that collectively we can do this great work together. Yeah, amazing. Um, thank you both so much for sharing that. I think it underscores the point that like in a work environment, it is still like a microcosm of relationships and like a social environment and no one is like, just planted into their into their office un, unknowingly, you know, not living in the world. And so I, I think that like we have to remember there is all of this like crap and racism and sexism and and fat phobia and all of these things that we're living in. And then we bring that to the office place. And if you aren't self-aware and self-reflective of, of who you are bringing into that office space, it is impossible to speak up and to be an ally and to discuss that. I also think that there, there's a calling in and a calling out. And sometimes there are things where you legitimately need to just call it out and it needs to be visible um, and it needs to be in public and it needs to be like, this is not okay. There's also like a calling in and there are certain circumstances depending on kind of like different, different relationships of power where you need to call someone in and bring them in and have a conversation and, and address it. And I, I've seen this happen. Uh, I, I joke with some coworkers. I'm like, white gay men can be my biggest pain in the butt sometimes. And I, you know what, but it's, 
it is my it is my responsibility to have those conversations. Um, and I think one of the things that I have noticed amongst the queer community is like what is okay to joke about and what is not. And I think realizing where you are and that sort of hierarchy of power and privilege and everything else, there are some things that are not a joke. And I think that we that we do need to to realize where we are and what we are saying and things that Matthew or Steph can joke about or make comments about in their communities are not the same things that I can and should and would say. And I think that knowing that and knowing those boundaries are really important. Oh, great advice. Mm, thank you. I wish I had access to this when I was doing my search after college. Oh, so let's let's talk a little bit about that job search. You know, uh, a lot of the folks here are in that stage, um, you know, sort of wrapping up college, looking for what comes next. So I have a couple of questions for you all about that. Like, what are some resources that students can use to find fellowships, internships, entry-level positions, and other post-grad opportunities? And even more broad than that, sort of what do you wish you knew when you were starting off that job search, particularly as it pertains to the, to the LGBTQ um, IA plus community? I'll go first. We'll switch up the order. I'm actually fascinated to see because I, I mean, I, so after college, I knew I wanted to live and work abroad and I'd studied um, a broad, I had the opportunity to do that in Turkey. So I've, most of my career, except for, it's been in the Middle East, honestly. So that's sort of where, besides my uh, LGBT portfolio hat that I also wear, I mean, that's what I've covered. So I did Peace Corps after school as a way to, to work overseas. Um, and so I, I sort of knew that I wanted to do government work. And so I think if you, there's, I'm excited to hear, and I'm so glad we have like different sectors on because I knew I wanted to do State Department, like any job that I could find at State Department, it was like my dream agency to work on. So I worked in a bureau that I was like, not a great fit for, I was working in Middle East stuff, not a great fit for my skill set, not a great fit for, for sort of what I was doing, but it was an entry point and it was an opportunity. If you are interested in government work, feel free to reach out to me. USA Jobs is an absolute mind hole. I don't want to like bore you all with that, but I do have phenomenal resources. I have gotten several positions through USA Jobs. I have coached other people on how to do USA Jobs resumes. Um, I am passionate about, yes, there is a screwed up system, but there is also a way to smartly figure out the system. And that is what it is. Um, there is also, I mean, there's USA Jobs. There are fellowships. If you do a Fulbright, a Boren Fellowship. Um, there's different Pickering and Wrangell Fellows for the State Department uh, specifically or for marginalized groups or groups with um, just more diverse backgrounds. They're really competitive, but you don't, you get none of the jobs you don't apply for. Um, I will say apply strategically. I think that sometimes people will just send out like a thousand resumes stupid. That's a waste of your time. It's a waste of your time. And frankly, it's a waste of the time of those of us that have to review them. So think about what you want to do and then look at the actual job description of that, figure out a way to talk to people who are in and around that field. And then you have to tailor your resume. I, I don't know exactly what the system is these days, but I can tell you if someone just sends me a resume that looks no different than how they would apply to be like an astronomer. And it's just like a list of what you've done. That is, that is not telling me how you would be an advocate in my organization. I do, I do lobbying, I do negotiations. I need you to convince me that like the experience that you have is going to be a value add to the office. Um, and that unfortunately in this world, oftentimes is like your first, your first venture, your venture point, right? It's just, it's, it's flat, it's black and white. No one sees like our fun, quirky personalities on that. But you need to have something that is like indicative enough that you spent time doing that and it aligns to the position. And then you get to shine in an interview. And if you don't shine in an interview, get a coach. Figure out how to shine in an interview. Look at the questions. Practice. And I will say, and this isn't where a certain thing, but what I have noticed is there is a generational gap in what you wear to things. There is a level of a professional thing that you need to wear to an interview that I don't care if you, it, it does not matter how you would like to present. It has nothing to do with your hair or whatever else. It is like wear, cover your shoulders and whatever blazer or shirt you feel appropriate is. Do not wear something that is too short. 
wear a shoe that is appropriate. Look at where you're interviewing. If you're interviewing at State Department and you don't show up in some version of a blazer and, and pant or skirt accoutrement, that is somewhat inappropriate. Um, if you're working at an NGO, Google, totally different, like stop listening to me. I'm sure it's a different, I'm sure it's a different uh, dress code. I know dress codes are stupid, but it's also, you get to choose where you apply and, and you get to choose sort of the avenue. So if you don't want to ever have to wear a blazer, don't apply to a federal job, you know? Like, it's just one of those things that like, know what you want and then really hone in on that. Um, but yes, very passionate about like making sure that we are smart and, and strategic and where we apply and what we wanna do and then going for it. Um, anyway, happy to share some resources on USA Jobs specifically because that has been my entire career as sort of with State Department in different positions. And I have to agree totally about, you know, not sending a thousand different applications, a thousand different resumes out there, um, like you mentioned, Taylor. For me, it's like, find what it is that you're looking for. And, you know, whether it's the five companies, the five offices or whatnot, then figure out how it is you're going to get there and find the people that are already there that you can connect with. And if you don't know anybody, somebody has to know them. Somebody always knows these people. And that's what I tell you, like for me, LinkedIn is, is awesome because even though I feel like I'm, I'm snooping around a little bit, but it's like, I know who's connected with who and I know their friend or their mentor or I know that they work here and I'm going to just visit. The way that I got into, I, I always say my, my dream school, which is Gallaudet University, was because I visited the school 20 times. And I was there and I met with everyone that I could and I spoke to everyone to the point that they already thought I was a student till I got in and I got in with a full ride. You know, it's leveraged those networks. Absolutely. You know, and as now that I work in outreach, I work in partnership development. And it's even, even more important for me to know who's who and how to get people connected. So anyway, I'm happy to, to support anybody that's also looking for, for their next move. Because uh, again, we, we have to be those resources for each other. So I'm, <laughs> Taylor gave you guys a little, a little you know, a piece of insight that I, I hate to have to say is true, but the generational divide is real. And I will tell you that interview suit you have, you're gonna need it in a lot of policy realms because it gives them one less thing to talk about and one less thing for them to use it as a distraction from listening to your words. Like whenever, when I would go to the Hill, whenever I meet with a Republican office, I always put on a tie. Do I wanna wear a tie? No. Do the ladies I'm with always have a big purse that they switch their heels on right before they go in? Yes. Why? Because it's just one less thing for them to like think, oh, you're not one of us, so you can't, you clearly can't be an effective advocate. And so sometimes being an effective advocate is getting your weight yourself into the room. You might not have to wear it all the time. There are many jobs I've had where I kept a hill suit at the office and I wore my jeans and t-shirt into the office. And then when I went to the hill, I was like, oh, let me change. And as soon as I got back, I changed back. But it is so important that you have kind of the tools that you need to do what you want. And in terms of getting a job, find the organizations that are doing work that you find inspiring, things that would light your heart on fire, and then figure out what level you wanna do it at. Some of you will want to work at the behemoths. Some of you will not. All can be do effective work. It's about finding someone that has values and missions that you believe in. Every job I took, has always been because I, they had a mission that I believed in. And it always makes it easier to show up for work. And I did all that research beforehand. And then, as both my previous panelists said, I tailored that resume. Because you want to use words that relate to words that they have on their website and page. It shows that you are in conversation with them. Your cover letter should reflect similar adjectives, similar descriptions of the work. Have your take. Definitely make it be like, I'm already in conversation with you. Clearly, I'm one of you. You want to know more about me because clearly I'm the kind of people that you like because that's how you present yourself front facing. Can um, I just, can I say, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's, it's, and then there's listeners. Um, I don't know where all the listeners are these days, but they're listeners. Uh, I know the black, um, the black, doo -doo 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 -doo, the black, the Congressional Black Caucus maintains a listserv. I bet. 
Latinos vote, Hispanic Caucus has a listserv probably. There are lots of listservs and just pick what you want to apply for. There's also the LGBTQ caucus um, listserv as well. So especially if you're trying to get on the Hill, it's looking at all these, um, these staff groups, these um, affinity groups and connecting with them, right? And most of them have like their own landing page where you can like even find their emails and be like, hey, I'm looking for a job. And they have also uh, a directory, a repository of resumes that, you know, you can send your resume and someone can support you, you know? So there's also that. Um, I'm gonna add some of those links on the, on the chat for y'all. You're a rock star, Steph. Um, I, something Matthew said just sparked in me. It, it is true to like find a job that you think has your values. It is also true you were not married to that job forever. Like if you, I entered working in, in security in the Middle East, like did nothing related to, to queer advocacy, nothing related to policy in that sense. And then I transitioned to a role that I was like, you know what, I want to go back in that human rights space. I want to go back in the advocacy space and I want to do it with the government. Um, you can work in a job and do that job and, and have also a million extracurriculars and get involved in other things to sort of like light that fire of being involved in a queer community. So I wouldn't, I, there, honestly, like I wouldn't say that, that just because you identify in the LGBTQIA plus umbrella that like you have to work on LGBT policy. Like that is, that is crazy talk. Like there are so many interesting NGOs and, and spheres of the world to not limit yourself. Sure, you want an inclusive workplace. Sure, you want something that you enjoy going to work every day. Sure, you wanna do either policy or programs or a combo. But I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that like just because I am a queer person, I like have to work on this. And in fact, like, Sometimes I think that there's so many other, like the intersectionality point, I mean, education, climate, um, races, like there's so many like different avenues to be an advocate in whatever role you are. So be that advocate in whatever job. If you're freaking answering calls for like, for HHS Medicaid lines, great. You can be a phenomenal advocate in that role too. You can start an inclusive sort of like, group work culture and, and, you know, DEIA council in that job too. And so be creative with yourself of, of not limiting yourself to, I only want to work at human rights campaign, or I want to work at council for global equality and like those, or, or grinder or lately, those are the three places I want to work. Um, because there's a lot of organizations that are doing phenomenal inclusive work, but like the top theme is not LGBT. If that makes sense. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, you're not married to a job. You can move jobs. And in fact, you probably should move jobs over, over the course of a career. Uh -uh. I would just throw in a little two cents there is that we actually need queer people to be in all the jobs because we literally show up everywhere. So we need people who work in employment policy. We need people who are working education. We need people who work in energy policy. Um, we need people in food policy. We can literally be everywhere and sometimes bringing the perspective you have is going to be uniquely important for how that policy area gets shaped. Beautiful, thank you. And, and Taylor, your point about not being married to a job and being able to find what fulfills you in other spaces is for me particularly resonating because I, since like 2008 to like 2020 have mostly been working in government spaces and no one would think that I'm like a social justice person based on my resume but all of my volunteer work has been heavily in that space. And I've built a portfolio that was strong enough that I'm now about to start a new role in that space, which I've been wanting to do for a while. So I think that's a really great point as well, that like, if you're not finding what you're looking for at work, or you don't want to be like your whole life is about work, you can find things that fulfill you outside and build a great um, portfolio that way as well. So I want to switch over to um, questions from the audience. And we, we have one queued up already. Um, it's related to this concept we talked about before around if you feel comfortable being out um, in the workspace and, and even beforehand, um, how you present that, um, sort of the appearances of all that, which I know can be really important because I remember when I came out at work about being gender fluid, I had like several people run up to me and say, thank you so much. And, you know, they're like secretly quietly, like hinting that they're part of this community, but they don't feel comfortable sharing. And they're so excited that there's someone else who's basically being that voice for them. So this is like going to happen, you know, um, often I think in your career. So this question that we have is coming from, I think, is it Lala? It's related to that. Would you like to unmute and ask? 
Hi, I'm, I'm Layla C. Williams. My pronouns are she, hers. Um, I just graduated from college last month, so I'm on job search. Um, I'm bisexual, and so on my LinkedIn, like, I put, um, like, this woman is Black, queer, and educated, and, like, I was getting some comments from people, like, oh, like, should that be on your LinkedIn? And so I just wanted to know if you share your gender identity and sexuality on your LinkedIn profile or, like, other publicly facing social media accounts. I'm gonna respond and then I'm gonna actually head out. Um, I, I'm gonna retreat this week and I present in about 10 minutes, but I wanted to answer your question. There is, I think anywhere that you look for my name in any kind of professional setting, personal, whatever, I am this, you know, and it's taken me quite some time to, to feel as comfortable uh, as I do, but the reality is I'm going to walk into a space as my full self, because if I don't, I'm not going to give you the work ethic that, that you want. I'm not going to be able to bring my A game. And I've noticed that um, throughout different places. And, you know, I've moved, I think, um, to various different jobs where sometimes I've felt limited because I have to kind of perform. I have to kind of put myself in, you know, uh, a certain position to feel more accepted by my colleagues, right? Or not to make them uncomfortable, right? But it's gotten to a point where y'all are going to have to live with that discomfort. Y'all are going to have to, you're going to have to figure it out, right? Um, and we're going to have to learn and work to, how to work together with that. And put it on your LinkedIn, you know, um, because this is, it's, you're not alone, right? And, and that's where I always, uh, I'm always glad to, to see like more folks coming into these spaces and we, we've got each other, you know, like, like I mentioned, it's like, there you are, you know, and I'm right here and, and I'm just so happy to, to be able to sh um, share it with everyone today. Thanks so much for being with us, Steph. Hope your presentation goes well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Taylor and Matthew. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> I might have a slightly more conservative stance on that um, in that I definitely pronouns. My pronouns are my signature. We're trying to like normalize them in the government. Um, pronouns I think are important. I also have a name that I'm constantly Mr. Westfall. It drives me nuts. So I, um, I fully support pronouns. I, I think in, I mean, I think there's a different, I mean, obviously we all know this, but there's a difference between like, gender identity and like sexual orientation. I don't feel like I like, deserve no one needs to know about like my sex life or who I'm sleeping with or married to necessarily via like my LinkedIn I think that like my board member of an affinity organization that covers LGBTQI stuff my like volunteer work my activism I think speaks for itself I think if you I I mean I I think queer is a beautiful word which is how I identify I I um I would say I've had very awkward sort of work experiences, having dated men in the past, having been married to a woman, people who've known me for a while were initially confused. I just, sometimes you don't wanna have to like talk about that or like have to explain yourself at all times. So I really think it's like what you are comfortable with. I am also like a military spouse. I don't have like that, like on, like, I feel like we all, and a lot of people do, right? We all have like different identities that we want to like lean forward more on and others that we're just sort of like, this is one of them. Like we all have a lot of different things, right? Um, I, pronouns, I 100% support. I think it depends on like kind of what line of work you're also trying to go into. I would be care, I mean, social media, I went to the vice president's party on Tuesday, y'all, and I posted like a beautiful picture and I totally everyone who's on my Instagram which is private knows that I'm married wedding photos like my co I think I think also I would keep in mind and maybe this is like a slightly more government conservative and someone who's worked in security anything can be found so which is good you don't want people to blackmail you it's a it's a if you're trying to get a security clearance at some point in time great you're out and that can be an asset it can be an asset now instead of a liability and I think you should frame it that way I would also be careful about just like how much information you are constantly choosing to share and just like think about the ramific I learned from from uh, one of my lovely wonderful best friend co-workers that there's now this thing where you share a photo of like where you are every day and like be real there's just so much like information sharing at all times and I I mean not to scare you but I just like I would think about like how much you're putting out there and what that and what that can impact I'm not saying to not write that you're not queer or a lesbian or gay or proud this and that, and certainly people do. 
I just think I would, I would think about it and think about what things that might open doors for you as an opportunity. And then what that might sort of like square you into or buckle you into or create a different, a different experience. I don't mean to be like a, a wishy-washy Libra on this, but I just, I think it's like worth considering and thinking. It's interesting. I was, Taylor made me think, so I just checked my social media account. Or that anything's going on. I think it's the what do you want your conversation starters to be, and what do people want to know up front. And also, just like not everyone needs to have a right to know everything about you all of the time, but you'll figure it out. Like I would say, Google me, and if you Google Matthew Rose, shame on you because you will find a very large white man who is an opera singer. But if you Google Matthew Rose and the word gay, health, global health, HIV. All kinds of things will come up with all kinds of things about me. Um, it's on government record that I'm a slut. You know, I said it in a meeting. It's fine. It worked well. It was it was proving a point to them. But do remember, like, with social media especially, like, you get to control what people see, how people see it, and how people, how you want to present to people. And sometimes you want to put it all up front and just say, listen, if you have a problem with that, I don't want to work for you. Sometimes you're like, no, I don't. I don't need to do all that at once. Like you'll figure it out. And sometimes you want to be in between, but you get to decide for you where you want to go. And the you that you put out there is the you that people will engage with. And I'll also say, know that almost every employer is going to do a social media dive on you. Like there's just too much out there these days. And it's just so you get to decide when they want to see things and how you want to disclose. So do what you feel comfortable with but know that it goes both sides. And especially for those of y'all who decide to work for LGBTQ organizations, it can be exhausting being a professional queer all the time. Cause it seems like you're always speaking for the community. You always have to know for the community. Never you could just, just be a part of the community. It's always extra for the community. So there's no like perfect way to do it, but I would say you, even if you leave it out, you always have the ability to disclose and choose how you want to disclose and give yourself whatever options make the most sense for you at the right time. Well, so we have just a few minutes left. So Alice, uh, do you think we should take another question or wrap it up? I just want to be mindful of time. I think we have time to take one more question. Um, so if folks have a question, you can send it to me directly or at this point, feel free to use the raise hand feature and we'll go ahead and call on you. Someone had a question in the chat of identity in a cover letter. I think it kind of goes with what Matthew and I were talking about. I mean, I don't, pronouns I think are normal in a cover letter. I, unless you are applying directly for an advocacy job that is like, in an LGBTQI plus organization and that that is your role, I don't, I don't know if, I don't know. I don't know if there's like, if you need to like lead with that. Like, I think in the end, like it is a job and I don't want my job to be being like a queer person. Like my job is that I'm a lobbyist. My job is that I'm negotiating UN resolutions. My job is that I'm doing like NEA policy. Like I don't, and in fact, working in the Middle East, I actually like don't need to lead with that. And I do need to be respectful in different situations and circumstances, working with a lot of countries that criminalize homosexuality. So I think like being cognizant of like, what are you, is if your job is something that is directly related to that, yes. If it is not, I don't, I don't know if like, if that's like necessary to include in there would yeah. be my, my two cents. I just really quickly add, and then we can go to the, the question is, I, I would say that your work count in your cover letter, space is really precious. And so you wanna think what are the most important things they need to know about me to get me this job? And if it says in the application, like I need to know that you're queer to get this job, one, that's probably illegal. And two, uh, you're, you're using space that's not talking about the skills and who you are and how you're going to do the job. Thank you. But I thought there was a question. Yeah. Um... Okay. I was just gonna say, uh, Cicely has um, their hand up, so I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to them to ask their question. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm a big plan supporter, so thank Nancy and everybody here, Mara, for putting this on. Um, I have a quick question from the employer perspective. 
So I'm a lobbyist in DC, have been on the Hill, been in private sector, and now I have my own lobbying firm. And so my question for you guys, I've hired my, I've hired an, um, my first LGBTIA, uh, LBGTQIA plus, the coffee has not kicked in yet, um, intern this summer who was on this call. And so what advice do you have for employers? And I agree with everything you guys have said about resumes and, you know, showing up in interviews like spot on. But for an employer who wants to be more supportive, what is your advice for me? That's it. I would say affirming policies uh, and procedures because clear cut, those are so helpful. Um, give people opportunities. Like often someone gets hired as the queer person and then they never, it's like, do you have any other interests? No, you're just a queer person all the time. And they might have other interests and other perspectives that can be useful on other things and just being open to that. So like, yeah, I hired you to take this portfolio, but like as a person who was on the Biden policy internal group, our group covered everything under the sun. And a queer, there's queer perspectives on almost everything under the sun. So just allowing people to have that ability to be open and then show up as their whole self to work. Um, but also know that like, they might not always wanna be on all of the time. Cause as I said, it's exhausting. <laughs> Um, yeah, Thank I you mean, so I, I, I oh. your job is to be the professional gay. <laughs> so sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, I just want to be respectful um, of our panelists time um, because we're at time right now. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this special Pride Month fun talk. And thank you so much to our panelists um, for sharing all of your advice and resources with our students. We really appreciate it. Thank you all so much for joining and have a great rest of your afternoon. Yeah. Don't Thanks be afraid to us. Google us and reach out. Thank you so much. Yep. And wonderful to meet you, Matthew and, and yep. Raquel. I'm sure we also know a million of the same people. Probably. So. Reggie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, best of luck to all of you. For those employers, for the people who are, who are looking for jobs, keep on going. We're excited to have you. I don't envy you. Glad I'm not, glad I'm not right out of college right now. Love you all.